what happened was Allah now this incident took everyone by surprise wa aqulu qala Allah jalla jalaluhu wal mustafa al hadi wa la atawalu alhamdulillah rabbil alamin lahu alhamdu al hasan wa al thana al jamil wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah yaqulu al haqq wa huwa yahdi as-sabil wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد ان شاء الله تعالى we're going to resume the uh, seerah uh, the biography of our messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah صلى الله عليه وسلم in today in شاء الله تعالى's session we're going to be talking about hadith al-fil hadith Al-Fil, the story behind the elephant. Um, Hadith Al-Fil, um, it's also known as Qisatu. Does anyone know? Qisatu Abraha, the story of Abraha. This is a very, as Al Imam Al Suhaili mentions in his Kitab Rawdul Unuf. He says that it is a he says وَأَمَّا حَادِثُ الْفِيلِ فَهُوَ حَادِثٌ عَظِيمٌ It was a very big event. لَمْ يَحْدُثْ مِثْلُهُ فِي تَارِيخِ الْعَرَبِ In Arab history, what we've taken, there's nothing like it that's ever happened. Okay? They've never seen anything like this. And uh, Suhaili mentions something very profound. He says, and the reason why Allah made it happen the same year where the Prophet was born was because وَكَانَ دَلِيلًا عَلَى ظُهُورِ حَادِثٍ أَكْبَرٍ That something greater was to happen after this. It was preparation for the Prophet ﷺ to come. And it was, a, it was to raise the station and the position that Mecca had, Allah wanted to put even higher. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the story is Abraha Al Ashram, who was a Amil of Al Najashi. Remember, we spoke about Abraha. Who remembers what we mentioned about him in our previous class? How did a Abyssinian man take over Yemen? And who were the people of Yemen? Yeah? Who were the people of Yemen? We mentioned they were the people of Seba, right? And the people of Seba, we said they are what? They are Arabul. They are Arabul Ariba. They were original Arabs. Sah? So how did it happen that an Abyssinian man from, from Habasha to control over this part of the land. I mentioned this to you guys, huh? Who remembers it? Hey? Najashi was not in control of Abyssinia. I want to know how he came into power, hey? Adam. How did Najashi come to, into power in Yemen? Hey, anyone else? Huh? Najashi sent an army from Abyssinia. Hey? Ariak was the leader of Yemen. So he was his right hand man. And then Najashi assassinated him and took over Yemen like that. He was a soldier and he was the army, the military. Fakat. So now Abraha is, is a representative of who? Is a amil for who? Najashi. This is the story of Yemen. Abraha made the decision to build a church, a very big church in Sana'a. And he wanted to make it a church as he put it, Lam yura mithluha. No one has ever seen the likes of it. And he called it 
Qulays, that was the name he gave it. And some of the historians, they say he called it Al-Qulays, the Tashdeed al lam Al-Imam Al-Suhayli, look what he mentioned about how he built it. So it's a benefit, write it down. Al-Suhayli I mentioned to you is the one I'm going to reference a lot because he has done the Sharah of Sirat ibn Hisham. صح? He has an explanation on it. He says, وَكَانَ أَبْرَهَةُ قَدْ اسْتَدَلَّ أَهْلَ الْيَمَنِ فِي بُنْيَانِ هَذِي الْكَنِيسَةِ الْخَسِيسَةِ He humiliated the people of Yemen in building this church. صح? He humiliated them and he put them down. وَكَانَ يَنْقُلُ إِلَيْهَا الْعَدَدُ مِنَ الرُّخَامِ الْمُجَزَّعَ وَالْحِجَارَ الْمَنْقُوشَةِ بِالذَّهَبِ مِنْ قَصْرِ بَلْقِيسِ صَاحِبَةِ السُلَيْمَانِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Balqis, her palace, the gold that was there, he took it from it. He broke the palace of Balqis. You all know Balqis, right? And he took that gold and he used that gold to build this church from it. He then says, وَنَصَبَ فِيهَا سُلْبَانًا مِّنَ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ He placed a cross that was made out of gold and silver. وَكَانَ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَرْفَعَ فِي بِنَائِهَا حَتَّى يُشْرَفَ مِنْهَا عَلَىٰ عَدًا And he raised it so much that it will become the most beautiful place, the most respected place, that somewhere where everybody would come towards. وَكَانَ حُكْمُهُ فِي الْعَامِلِ he had a ruling and a judgment on the people who used to build for him. The construction men, what he would do to them is, إِذَا طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ وَلَمْ يُكْمَلْ عَمَلَهُ وَلَمْ يُكْمِلْ عَمَلَهُ And he didn't complete his work. If the worker, the sun came up and he never completed the portion that was required from him, أَنْ يَقْطَعَ يَدَهُ He would cut their hands off. So it was very harsh on them. He wanted it to finish at a certain time. He wanted it to be, it to be done in a certain way. This is who he was. He wrote to uh, Najashi Abraha. He said, "Inni qad banaytu laka ayyuha al-maliku kanisatan lam yubna mithluha li malikin kana qablak." I have built for you a church. He said this to Najashi. Abraha said this to Najashi. No one has ever built this for a kingdom like the way I built it for you. And he said, I haven't completed my virtue onto you and the good that I want to do for you, I haven't completed it yet until I divert the Arabs from going to Mecca. I divert them from there and I bring them to this church. So that was his aim. He wanted to move all the Arabs from the church, uh, from the Mecca, and bring them to this big church that he built. When the Arabs, they started to converse and to talk amongst themselves, and they heard what Abraha was trying to do, and what he promised in his letter for Najashi, a man heard who was from Bani Kinana. A man from the people of Kinana, he heard, عَلَيْهِ الْأَمْرُ The matter became heavy on him. He couldn't accept that. That a church that will be built is going to be, a, it's going to be taken as a substitute of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Mecca, which was built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَهُوَ مِنَ الْعَرَبِ الَّذِينَ رَضَعُوا بِلِبَانِ حُبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ وَتَعْظِيمِهَا This was an Arab man who was raised and respecting this Kaaba and honoring it. Um, so he went, this man, this Arab man, he left. فَخَرَجَ حَتَّى أَتَى الْكَنِيسَةِ He came to the church. فَدَخَلَ لَيْلًا He entered night time. فَلَطَّخَ قِبْلَتَهَا He went to the the front part of it, and he, he did feces on it. And then he took dead corpse and he threw it inside the church. And then when he did his feces, he rubbed it against the walls of the church. 
فغضب ذا عند ذلك أبرها أبرها became very angry with this وحلف and he made a promise he said لا يسيرن إلى البيت who did this they told him an Arab man from the people of Kinana did this and his aim was to belittle this church of yours and he did it in retaliation of your letter to Najashi because you said in that letter you wanted to turn the Arabs away from going to the Kaaba and you wanted them to come to your church. He got hurt by that. He became upset with that and that's why he did it. So Abraha said, I will go to the uh, Kaaba. This is something I want to say as a benefit. What Najashi and Abraha wanted to do is a very evil thing, to divert the people from the Kaaba, right? But this is a powerful lesson for all of us, which is in Islam, if we see evil, we should not try to remove that evil with a greater evil. If you know that you saw evil and you say to yourself, I'm going to remove this evil, and the way that you remove it is going to bring a greater evil than the current evil in Islam, you're not allowed to do that. The Prophet والسلام, he said, If any one of you sees munkar, stop it with your hand. فَإِن لَمْ يستطع, If you're not able to do it. فَبِلِسَانِي Say it with your tongue. فَإِن لَمْ يستطع, And if you're not able to do it with your tongue. فَبِقَلْبِهِ Hate it in your heart. Then the Prophet said, وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَانِ And that is the lowest form of Iman. And this is the hadith that the scholars use that the iman goes up and down because the prophet said this is the lowest of iman. So what we take from the hadith is that the inkarul munkar, removing the evil has maratib, has levels. The highest level is what? The hand. And then second comes what? The tongue. And then the third comes what? The heart. And there is nothing below that. Does that make sense? Some people, they see an evil, and as soon as, as soon as they see an evil, they say, لا بد من إنكار المنكر. I have to stop the evil. Because Allah says, كنتم خير أمة أخرجة للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله. And also Allah says, ولتكم منكم أمة يدعون إلى الخير ويأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر. Another ayah, Allah says, لعن الذين كفروا من بني إسرائيل على لسان داود وعيسى بن مريم ذلك بما عصوا وكانوا يعتدون كانوا لا يتناهون عن منكر فعلوه لبئس ما كانوا يصنعون. So إنكار المنكر stopping the evil yes but then if you stop it and then it, or you stop it in a way that's going to create a greater evil you're not allowed to stop an evil and bring about a greater evil. Are we all together? Or even an evil equal to it. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So this Arab man became passionate and what did he do? He went and he went into the Kenisa. He didn't like what he saw. And he did this and this caused a bigger problem because now Abraham made a promise what? that he's going to go to the Kaaba and destroy it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his protection for the Kaaba. So he said, I'm going to go to the Kaaba and I'm going to destroy it. And he took an army that was never seen by the Arabs before. They had no power for it and they didn't have the force and the, the number for it. And by the way, in the Arabian Peninsula, they have never seen elephants before. Are we all together? Elephants have not been seen in the Arabian Peninsula. It's not an animal that you've seen. You all know the famous story that Imam Malik was doing a lesson one day and some of the students, they left the class while he was teaching. And then one of the students remained while the others went. So Imam Malik said to the one student that remained, why are you here? He said, my parents, my family members did not send me 
to go and look at an elephant because the students, they all never saw an elephant. So they went to the city of Medina, an elephant for the first time came in. They had never seen it before. He said, my family, they sent me and I came, and I traveled and I got that distance to watch you, Imam Malik, and to learn from you. So the Arabs were not acquainted with elephants. They didn't know elephants. They didn't know how to deal with elephants. So Abraham made a promise that he was going to take an army. With him came There was either nine or thirteen, according to different sources. Some of the sources mentioned he had thirteen elephants, and some said nine elephants. And he chose for himself Abraha, the biggest elephant. واختار لنسي أكبر الفيلة he said I'm gonna me personally I'm gonna take the biggest elephant. And he called that uh, feel he called it Mahmud. Abraha called it what? Mahmud. The Arabs they heard it. And they came down onto him like a thunder. They came down on him. And they saw that fighting with him was necessary. The Arabs, all of them, they said, we need to fight with him. When they heard that he wanted to destroy the Kaaba. A man came to him who was min ashrafi ahli al-Yemen, one of the greatest people of Yemen. His name was called Dhu Nafarin. That was his name. He called his people and all the other, he called all of his people, he said, come together. And all of the other Arabs that would listen to him, he called them all to fight Abraha and to wage war onto him because he wants to destroy the Kaaba, uh, the place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam to build. So they went and they fought him. And Dhu Nafar was destroyed. Then Dhu Nafarin said to him, Ayyuhal Malik, O king, talking to Abraha, La taqtulni. After his whole army got destroyed and Dhu Nafar's entire army was dismantled and finished by Abraha, he said to Abraha, La taqtulni, don't kill me. فَإِنَّهُ asa." Because there could be a possibility أَن يَكُونَ بَقَائِي مَعَكَ خَيْرًا لَكَ مِنْ قَتْلِي That me remaining with you and just being with you might be of some benefit for you. Don't kill me. His whole army was destroyed and killed and he said, don't kill me, please. He begged. He said, don't kill me. Maybe if I stay with you and I remain with you, I might bring you some benefit in your, in your venture. فَتَرَكَهُ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ Abraha said, okay, I won't kill you. And what did he do? He chained him up in heavy chains. Then Abraha carried on eh, to go towards where he wanted to. When he came to a place called Ard Khath'am, Abraha came to it. عرض له نفيل بن حبيب الخثعمي. This man, Nufayl ibn Habib al-Khath'ami, which is the second man, he waged war on him. He waged what? War on him. And Khath'am were two main tribes, Shahran wa Nahis. With these two big armies, he waged war on them. And all the other tribes that went with him. Dhu Nafar is still alive, he's with him. The first one. But his whole soldiers and armies and the ones who came with him got killed. Now the second time Abraha has come into contact with the second tribe and they want to fight with him and Abraha destroyed them all. Then Nufayl ibn Habibin al-Khath'ami said to Abraha, Ayyuhal Malik, O King, la taqtulni fa'inni daliluka bi'ard al-Arab. He said, don't kill me. I'm even better than Dhu Nafar. I'm even better than him. How? I know the lands of the Arabs very well, corner by corner, edge by, I know all. I will tell you every spot and every place you should be. The valleys you could go to and get water for, from, for your army. The places you should travel day and the places you should travel at night. I, I have it all for you, mapped out. Let me go with you. And he said the two tribes 
that had fought you, the remaining ones, which is Shahran and Nahis, all of them, they come under me. So if I tell them, stop, listen, they will listen to me, they'll obey me. Abraha said, okay, I won't kill you. And he said to him, come, you come with me and show me the ro ro route. So he showed him the route until they came to Ta'if. Mas'ud ibn Mu'akib al-Thaqafi, who was a man of the people of Thaqif, he waged war on him. Abraha, which is, which number now? This is the third one. His name is Mas'ud ibn Mu'akib al-Thaqafi. The third man who waged war on Abraha in Ta'if. Does anyone here know where Ta'if is? Hey. Hey, what do you guys know about Ta'if inshallah in the seer of the Prophet So Ta'if was the place where the Prophet sallallahu was stoned, right? By little children. We're going to see that inshallah in the seerah. Good. So this man was from that people. His name is Mas'ud ibn Mu'attab and Mu'attib ibn Thaqafi. He when his army got destroyed by Abraha, which is the third man, he said to Abraha, أَيُّهَا الْمَلِكِ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ عَبِيدُكْ We are your slaves. سَامِعُونَ لَكَ مُطِيعُونَ We will listen to you, we will obey you. لَيْسَ عِنْدَنَا لَكَ خِلَافِ To be honest, there is no khilaf with us to you. وَلَيْسَ And there isn't, he said, بَيْتُنَا هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي تُرِيدُ That house that you're trying to destroy, the Kaaba, is actually not ours. What does he mean by that? The Kaaba had inside it lat. And remember when I mentioned, does anyone know who, who brought the idols for the Arabs? Huh? Huh? Amr ibn Luhay was the one who brought the idols from Sham. And remember when he brought the idols, he divided it amongst the Arab tribes. So lat was in Mecca, right? The people of Ta'if didn't have that idol. So that's not even our God, Aslam. That's the people of Quraysh's God. So if you go there and you destroy that, it's got nothing to do with it. That's what he meant. وَهُوَ بَيْتُ اللَّهُمْ بِالطَّائِفِ كَانُوا يَعْظِمُونَ تَحْتَ تَعْظِمِ He said, إِنَّمَا تُرِيدُ الْبَيْتَ الَّذِي بِمَكَّةً وَنَحْنُ نَبْعَثُ مَعَكَ مَنْ يَدُلُّكَ عَلِهِ We're going to help you even more. We're going to show you people to help you. Abraha went destroying everybody that went in his way. فَبَعَثُوا مَعَهُ رَجُلٌ هُوَ أَبُوْ رِغَالٍ يَدُلُّ عَلَى الطَّرِيقِ إِلَى مَكَّةً Ta'if and Mecca are very close to each other. And the people of Taqif in Ta'if have now given him one last person to help him even more now to help him on the way. So he took him with him. Abara took the man with him and said, come with me. Every little helps. Huh? Come and be with us. So Abraham went وَمَعْهُ الدَّلِيلُ حَتَّى أَنزَلَهُ الْمُغَمَّثِ He came to Mughammas. Mughammas is a mawdu' qurbu Mecca. It's a place that's very close to Mecca. And it's the path from Mecca to Mid uh, Mecca, sorry, Ta'if to Mecca. It's the road to it. That was the road he took him to. وَهُنَاكَ أَمَرَ أَبْرَهَةَ أَصْحَابَهُ بِالْغَارَةِ عَلَى نِعَمِ النَّاسِ فَبَعَثَ رَجُلًا مِنَ الْحَبَشِ يُقَالُ لَهُ الْأَسْوَدِ بِنُ مَقْصُودٍ عَلَى خَيْلٍ لَهُ Abraha, what he did was, when he came to that place, he took one of his soldiers and he said to him, take a horse and go to Mecca before us. His name was Al-Aswad ibn Maqsud. He said to Al-Aswad ibn Maqsud, take a horse and you go before us. He came to Mecca فَسَاقَ إِلَيْهِ أَمْوَالَ قُرَيْشٍ وَغَيْرَهُمْ Aswad ibn Maqsud and the little men that were with him, they went to Mecca and they took the money of the people of Mecca, robbed them, okay? And they took 200 camels of Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim is who? Yeah? Is the grandfather of who? The Prophet alayhi salatu and who was the head of the people of Mecca, Quraysh, at that time? Who was? Abdul Muttalib was at that time. All the tribes, Quraysh and Kinan and Hudayl and all of them, their stuff were taken. 
after the money was brought to Abaraha, they started to eat and feast, enjoy themselves and play, put the gold and everything that they had. He said, to Hunatat al-Himyari, a Yemeni man, he said to him, you go and ask Sayyidu Hadi al-Wadi, the man who is in charge of Mecca, go find out who he is. ثم قل له say to him إن الملك يقول لك say to that person whoever he is in charge of Mecca say to him that the king is saying إني لم آتي لحربكم that I did not come to wage war on you O people of Mecca إنما جئت all I came to is لهدم هذا البيت I'm just going to destroy the Kaaba and I'm going to go فإن لم تعرضوا if you guys do not get in my way and don't wage war with me. I have no reason to spill your bloods. But if you guys get in my way, I will fight you. And I have an army you guys cannot push away. When Hunata came to Mecca, and he sat down with Abdul, Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's granddad, he told him what Abraha said to him. He said, Abraha said this to me. Abdul Muttalib said to him, Wallahi ma nuridu harbah. Wallahi we don't want to fight with this man. Wa ma lana bidhalika min taqah. I'll tell you the truth, we don't even have the strength to fight anyways. Abdul Muttalib said, Hada baytullah. This house you see is Allah's house. Wa baytu khalilihi Ibrahim. And it's the house of who? The friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ibrahim alayhi salam. فَإِنْ يَمْنَعْهُ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ بَيْتُهُ وَحَرْمُهُ And if he's going to stop him, Allah is going to stop him from his own house. Allah is going to protect his house. And if Allah wants, Allah will let him destroy it. It's Allah's house. We don't have no strength. We can't even fight him if we wanted to. Hunata then said, فَانْطَلِقْ مَعِي إِلَيْهِ Come with me then, if there's no issue with you and him. Let's go to him. فَانْطَلَقَ مَعْهُ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ Abdul Muttalib went with Hunata. They went together. Okay. And they entered. And some of his little, Abdul Muttalib took some of his children with him. Some of the historians mention that one of the people he took was the Prophet's father, Abdullah. Some of them mention. But that's very far-fetched, right? Is it? Why? Because it's the year that the Prophet ﷺ is going to be born. And did the Prophet's father even know that Amina was, married, was pregnant? The majority of the view of the scholars is that he didn't even know she was pregnant, Aslan, when he died. And the Prophet ﷺ, he was born, according to uh, Suhail in his kitab, a few months after the event of Haditha, um, the event of the field. So he would have known that his wife was pregnant. Ala kullin, it seems like he didn't. But he took children with him. Allah knows who they were. And they went to Abraha with, with him. فَانْطَلَقَ مَعْهُ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبَ مَعْهُ بَعْضُ بَنِيهِ حَتَّى أَتَى الْعَسْكَرَ فَسَأَلْ عَنْ ذِي نَفَرٍ Abdul Muttalib, when he came there, he asked about the Nafar. وَكَانَ لَهُ صَدِيقًا They were friends. Abdul Muttalib and the Nafar were friends. حَتَّى دَخَلَ مَعَهُ فِي مَحَبَسِهِ The Nafar was the first one that was taken by Abraha. He was in chains. Abdul Muttalib said to him, يَا ذَا نَفَرْ هَلْ عِنْدَكَ مِنْ غَنَائٍ فِي مَا نَزَلَ بِنَا فَقَالَ لَهُ ذُو نَفَرٍ وَمَا غَنَاءُ رَجُلٌ أَسِيرٍ بِيَدَيْ مَلِكٍ يَنْتَظِرُ أَنْ يَقْتُلَهُ غُدْوًا أَوْ عَشِيًّا Abd al-Muttalib asked him, do you have for us a way out? Do you think there could be a way from this messy situation? Do you have any solution? Dhu Nafarin responded and he said, no, how do I have a solution? I'm in chains here. Any minute I'm waiting for him to kill me, to do what he wants to me. 
But there's one person I, can, I would tell you to talk to. Talk to Unais. He is the Sa'iqul Fil, the guy who's holding the rein of the cam, of the horse, uh, sorry, the, the, the field, the elephant. Talk to him, he's a friend of mine. And tell him what, this is not a good idea. Say what you can. Ala Kullin, Abdul Muttalib went and he said, I'm going to go to Abraha himself. Some of the scholars mentioned, Unais said, I can do you something. Because I have friendship in the past between me and Dhu Nafar, I can take you to Abraha and you can talk to him yourself and convince him to go return. So Abdul Malik, Abdi, Abdul Muttalib, he went. Abdul Malik, Abdul Muttalib, sorry. Abdul Muttalib was a man who was very tall, very tall man. And the scholars, the historians, all of them, they said he was a very handsome man. And he was also a man whose height was not with no meat, very skinny, and he wasn't very fat. He was, yeah, and he had enough meat to cover his body with a very strong physique. Who? Abdul Muttalib. And anyone who saw Abdul Muttalib the first time would be taken back because he had a big presence in the room. He saw him. ولذلك, when Abdul Muttalib walked on to Abraha, فَلَمَّا رَآهُ أَبْرَهَا أَجَلَّهُ Abraha, when he saw him, his jaw dropped. Okay? وَأَعْظَمَهُ And he said he venerated and respected him. He even said to him, Come here, sit right next to me. And a king doesn't place another king on his throne. So that's what he did. And even he didn't want, Abraha, when he saw Abdul Muttalib, he didn't want the other people to see Abdul Muttalib sit on the floor. So he told him, sit right next to me. And then because Abraha couldn't speak Arabic, he asked the translator, he said, say to him, what, what we want, why we're here. And ask him what he wants from us. Why is he here? What does he want from us? Abdul Muttalib said to the translator, I know why he's here, but I want him to hear why I'm here. He doesn't know why I'm here. He said, the reason I'm here is because I just need my 200 camels back. I want what? The 200 camels that when they came to Mecca and they stole, it personally belonged to me. It was personally mine. I worked for it. I want my 200 camels back. Then Abraha said to him, when you first entered onto me, Abraha said this, when you first entered onto me, I respected you and venerated you and looked up to you. I thought high of you. Now that I've heard what you had to say, now you've dropped in my eyes. I'm coming to destroy the Kaaba. And you're asking about 200 camels? Then Abraha responded and he said, Inni ana rabbul ibil. I am the owner of these camels. وَإِنَّ لِلْبَيْتِ رَبًّا And that house also has its Lord. سَيَمْنَعُ He will stop you from it. I need to look after mine and Allah will look after his. And then Abraha said, Your God cannot stop me from destroying this Kaaba. Look at my force and my strength. Abraha then said, give him back his 200 camels. And Abdul Muttalib, he took his 200 camels. All of the 200 camels that Abdul, uh, Abdul Muttalib had, what he did was, qalladaha wa ash'araha. What does that mean? He placed on the neck. What did he place on it? A rope. Sometimes it was a shoe, some different things they used to put on there. 
and he also made a mark on it, which is what we do today in Hajj. And he basically made every single one of those camels hadiyan. It was for the people of Mecca. And he said, I don't want the Lord of the Kaaba to be upset that we haven't done anything to defend its house. And he gave out the 200 camels. Abdul Muttalib stood up and he called the Arabs and he said, let's do something, let's fight. And he asked and he asked, but Abraha made his decision to come to the Kaaba. And he sent out an army and he put together his horses when he was Fi Wadi Muhassir. Wadi Muhassir is a valley between Muzdalifa and Mina. When he was there, Barak al Fil. The elephants, they went on their knees. And they were not able to move even an inch forward. They were not able to. Whenever they would be placed in the direction of the Kaaba, they would sit. And whenever they would turn back away from it, they would, they would run, they would move fast. Then Suhaili mentioned that Nufayl ibn Habib ibn al-Thaqafi, al-Khath'ami, who was one of the people's army who were destroyed, the second man, right? It was the second man. He whispered in the ear of the, cam uh, the elephant of who? Abraha. He whispered in the ear of the ear of Abraha. Which, what did he call his one? He called his elephant what? Mahmoud. So he whispered in it and he said to him, go on your knees, Mahmoud, like the rest. That's what he said to him. He said, you are in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the elephant sat on his, and went on his knees. Nufayl, he had no other power or anything else to do. So he kept pulling it down. But it's not that he can, so this is all from Allah. It's just little effort he can contribute. So he keeps pulling the elephant down. He wants the elephant to stay down. But he can't make an elephant stay down, nor can he make an elephant stand up. It is all from who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they started to hit the elephant and they started to whack the elephant. The elephant won't move. Whenever they would face towards Yemen, the elephant would run, not walk. Run, it would go for full, full speed. But ever, whenever they looked towards Mecca, like it, it would go on its. Whenever they would make it towards Sham, it would do the same. Il al Mashriq, anywhere. But as soon as it's made to face Mecca, it goes on its knees. Allah wanted to hold them there and not move. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, Tayyar al Ababil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent these birds from the sea. From the, from the sea, historians mention it. The word ababil, what it means is jama'at. The birds were not one, two, three. They were one off, they were like a, a whole entire, right after jama'at. Yatba'u ba'duha ba'da, they were following one another. That's what Ibn Kathir rahimahullah said. Each of the birds is holding three rocks, three stones. Hajar, a stone, he's holding it in its mouth, it's holding it. Bimimqarihi. And two stones, it's holding it in its legs. Those are three. La yusibu minum ahadun illa salat tataqatta'u a'ba'u wa yahla. Every person it hits, his skin and his yeah, and flesh will peel off his, from his body, cut into pieces. But it didn't go for every single one of them. The bird did not go for every single one of them. Um, some of them, Allah wanted them to live on to tell the story. So some of them, they ran away. 
And some of them ran to Nufayn saying, please tell us the road to Yemen. We don't want to stay here for a minute. We want to go out of this place. Show us the path to Yemen. And there's the line of poetry of Nufayn when he saw what was happening. He said, Aina al mafarru wal ilahu attaribu. Where are you going to run when Allah is the one trying to come after you? Wal ashramu al maglubu laysa al ghalibu. And Abraha today is not the one that's going to be successful. Every one of them, they started to fall. When the birds hit them, it peeled their skin, destroyed them, and they were destroyed. As for Abraha, Allah sent for him subhanahu wa ta'ala an illness which caused his fingers to fall off. Finger by finger. It was coming off. By the time he reached Sana'a, his body was cutting off. His ears were coming off. His nose was coming off. By the time he reached Sana'a, he was like a fried bird. That's what he was. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, regarding that whole situation and what happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ أَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ is who? Abraha and who? That is army. Allah then says, أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلِ Allah made subhanahu wa ta'ala their plotting and their planning. What did he make it? In a state of loss and confusion and misguidance. They didn't achieve what they got. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٍ And Allah sent unto them what? Birds that were what? أَبَابِيلٍ Coming run after each other. So much. Fill the sky. تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ And it was carrying with them what? How much did each bird have? Three, one in his mouth, two with his hands, legs, and they were throwing it on them. Allah then says, فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ Brothers, what we learn, and honestly touches our hearts, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an army. Allah has a what? Junud, an army that we doesn't need us. If Allah wants to defend His religion, when He wants to defend His land, Allah's army, Subhanahu wa Taala, yeah, and He will do so, Subhanahu wa Taala. And this is what happened with Abraha. Allah destroyed him, Subhanahu wa Taala, with everything He had. No one could stop Him at that time. He brought everything to the table. For Allah wa ta'ala, He says, فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ He was demolished, brought to his knees. What happened was, Allah, now this incident took everyone by surprise. Quraysh and their affairs became serious. This incident of Hadith al Story of the elephants made Quraysh the people. This is what everybody was saying. Hum Ahlullah. These are the people of Allah. And it's true because Allah wanted to bring out of this raised people. Who did he want to bring out of it? The Prophet. They said Allah defended them. Allah supported them, Allah aided them. This house, something, huh? It's protected. وَلِذَلِكَ It sent a message to all of the other Arabs that the other Arabs, there were Ashwarul Hurum. There was months in the year where they would not fight, right? Quraysh, no one would ever fight with them. 
And no one would touch anything they were bringing to the Kaaba or taken from the Kaaba. Their stations went up in the air. All they had to do was place that mark yeah, and he put that in uh, yeah, and he, the shoe they would use or whatever they would put around the knuckles and then mark the hadi and that was it. They would see it. The highway robbers would see it. Thousands of camels go by, they wouldn't touch it. فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ That was in their hearts and mind. They saw if we touch these people's stuff, it's going to be problematic for us. وَقَدْ وَقَعَ هَذَا الْحَادِثُ فِي شَهْرِ الْمُحَرَّمِ It happened in what month? The month was Muharram in which it happened. How many days before the Prophet's birth, Suhaili, he says it was بخمسين so بخمسين fifty or بخمسين وخمسين يوما fifty five days before the Prophet was born عليه الصلاة والسلام and this was a مقدمة an introduction to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم coming into into this world now. The Prophet was born that year. There is no debate that the Prophet was born the year of the elephant. But what month was he born and what day was he born? There's no evidences to really, I mean, there is difference of opinion. Even the month. And even the what? The date. But the day, there is no dispute as well. What day was he born? And on Monday, the Prophet told us it was on Monday. We know the Prophet was born on a Monday. Who was born on a Monday? Put your hand up. Put your hand, just want to know. Who was born on a Monday? Who was born on a Tuesday? Wednesday? Thursday? Friday? Saturday? Sunday? And what we said Monday. So. Uh, who doesn't know what day they were born? It's good. You don't, it's not important. It's not important. Now, inshallah, ta'ala, I'm going to go through uh, quickly, bi-idhnillah al-kareem, the uh, nether of Abdul Muttalib, the promise that Abdul Muttalib made to slaughter one of his children. Abdul Muttalib, he went through a lot when he wanted to build the what? When he wanted to undig the what? The Zamzam. And he felt weakness when he wanted to do it. They were not helping him, they were not supporting him, so he felt weakness, Abdul Muttalib. He had no one to help him and support him. And he only had one child at that time whose name was Al Harith. So he made a promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said to Allah, Oh Allah, لَإِنْ وُلِدَ If I was given 10 boys and they reached the age, I will slaughter one of them for you. So Allah gave him subhanahu wa ta'ala 10 what? 10 boys. And the 10 boys Allah gave him was Al-Harith, which was the oldest. And his mother was what? Safiya binti Judbin. Az Zubair. Abu Lahab. Whose name was Abdul Uzza. Al Muqawwam. And Dirar. And Abu Talib. And Haji. And Abdullah. And Hamza. And Al Abbas. Allah gave him those 10 boys. Okay? Does anyone know which ones took Islam? So I'll say the names again and tell me which ones took Islam. Al Harith? No, he didn't. Al Zubair? No, he didn't. Abu Lahab? No, he didn't. Al Muqawwam? No, he didn't. Dhirar? No, he didn't. Abu Talib? No, he didn't. 
Hajj. No, he didn't. Abdullah, the Prophet's father. No, he didn't. Hamza. He did. Al Abbas. So those are the only, those are the only two that took Islam. What about his aunties? Huh? Only one. Who knows her name? Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. So Abdullah bin Zubair and the Prophet were cousins. That's why when Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi, he, what did he do to Abdullah bin Zubair? He killed him. Not only did he kill him, he hanged him on the Kaaba, on one of the pillars of the Kaaba. And Safiya, who was blind, she came and she grabbed the legs of her son and she cried on him. And then Hajjaj entered and he said to Safiya, Mom, and she said, Wallahi, I'm not your mom. I'm the mother of the one you killed here. Sah? So Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib was the youngest of the children of who? Abdul Muttalib. He was the youngest. He was younger than even Hamza. Abdullah ibn Abbas' father was the youngest, right? And who was the oldest? Al Harith. Which number does the Prophet's father fall under? His father was the third youngest. So Hamza, Hamza and Abdullah were next to each other. And there was one child between Abu Talib and Abdullah. Abu Talib was older. Hajj was between Abdullah and who? Abdul Muttalib. Abu Talib and who? Abdul Muttalib. Abu Talib and Abdullah, the Prophet's father. And the only ones that were the same mother was Abdullah, Abu Talib, and who? Az Zubair. These three had the same mom. Are we all together? They had the what? Same mom. The rest, they all had separate mothers. Only Muqawwam, some of the scholars, they say his mother was Hala. And Hala was also the mother of who? She was also the mother of Hamza as well. So let's, do you, how many sons did I say? 10. Allah gave him all those 10, right? Ibn Ishaq on the other hand, he believes that the youngest was Abdullah himself. Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq, he believes that. Suhaili lakin in his kitab, Rawdul Uluf, he said this is unknown, that Abdullah is the youngest. Maybe Ibn Ishaq may be talking about that the three who were from the same mother, Abu Talib and who? Az Zubair and Abdullah. Abdullah was the youngest. Which is true. Abdullah was the youngest there. Because Zubair was older than him and Abu Talib was older than him. As for the sisters, there were six. The Prophet's aunties were six. Safiya, and she's the only one who took Islam. Umu Hakim, who is known as Al-Bayda, Atika, Umayma, Arwa, and Barra. And as that, at those days, having sons was what? Was seen as something, right? Sah? Because once you have a boy, it was okay. You're protected. Your sons will stand up for you. Even the Arabs, the kunya was never taken from a girl. The mother, if she had a son, she would always call herself Umm Abdullah. So all the men would be like, okay, you know what? Leave her alone. She has a son. Sah? Um, and the tribes were like that. If you had a lot of sons, it was seen as something. There's a world like that today. Yeah? There's a world like that today. 
where the boys stand up and they do what's required from them. Yeah? Is it like that, brothers? I don't want to say it for you guys, but I'm hoping you guys can say it. Yeah? It's a bit changed right now, sir. If you have like 10 sons and you're a father and grow old, but in a lot of situations, the girls might stand up and do better than the boys. Like 10 sons, he has this father. All of his 10 sons are gone doing nothing. That one daughter he has is taking care of her father, providing for him. It's everything. It's that. That's not how it used to be. Ala kullin. Abdul Muttalib, when his sons became 10, and the people started to realize, okay, Abdul Muttalib is of now weight, okay? But he remembered the promise he made. This is another thing Arabs had. He made a promise, he will stick to his promise. So the promise he made was he was going to slaughter one of them. So what he did was, he said, I, I, want, to pro I, I want to fulfill my promise. So he asked them, how should I fulfill my promise? What do, what do we do here? He said. They said, take a what? A lot, right? Write the name of everyone on there. The fortune teller or whoever she, he went to said, bring all of their names for me. Each one written on it. He brought it. It was taken to the idol Hubal. And Hubal was an idol that was placed in the middle of the Kaaba. And then each of the lot was thrown. And every time it was thrown, whose name kept coming out? The Prophet's father. Abdullah, he kept coming out. And who is the one that he loved the most? Abdul Muttalib loved the most. Abdullah, he loved him. He loved him. And every time it came out, he would be shocked. Abdul Muttalib said, no, no, no. Again, try again. And it would be done again. Please try again. And he would try to avoid it being Abdullah. And he kept saying, what do I do now? If it's always going to be? Now, as I mentioned before, this was a practice of Jahili they used to do. That they took. They would slaughter their own son. They thought that was a form of sacrifice. That's when every time the lot came, he was told, okay, you know what? The only way you can reconcile between having Abdullahi and is that you give a hundred camels to free him from the sacrifice. Sah? And it reached a hundred. This story, a lot of the scholars, they weaken it. A lot of the ulama, they weaken the story. And uh, they say, this, there's no evidences for it. And even the hadith where the Prophet has said, I am the son of the two who were slaughtered, Ismail and who? Abdullah. That hadith, Imam Hakim narrated, is also weak. It's not Sahih. Okay? So, Shaykh al Albani, rahimahullah, he mentions this story, La asla lahu, it has no asal. And it has no base. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to stop there. Next lesson, I'm going to, going to mention the marriage of Abdullahi ibn Abdul Muttalib. The marriage of Abdullahi to who? To Amina. And their marriage, I'm going to mention that inshallah ta'ala and the birth of the Prophet alayhi alayhi salam. Brothers, if you guys just gave me five minutes after this, inshallah ta'ala, that I just want to mention. And um, recently, there's been a few people passing away who've died. We've been hearing, hearing the death of many uh, people dying. I just alone have heard of two, two people, three people, to be honest, their deaths. And to be honest, brothers, I just wanted us to take a lesson from all of this. The moat and the death of others is a lesson for us. When, I, when you hear the death of someone and they pass away, it's basically the angel of death saying to you, your time's coming. I'm coming for you. 
And some of these people, subhanAllah, actually all three of the people I've heard, they were not old people, they're very young. But the angel of death came to them. Brothers and sisters, I want to say this to you and I say it to myself all the time. What have you got ready for the day you stand in front of Allah? You are going to stand in front of Allah. Wallah, you're going to die and the angels of death are going to come to you. What have you got ready for that day? When you go to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you get questioned, you get interrogated. Ask yourself, what have I left behind? Have I done a well? Have I left beneficial knowledge? Have I got righteous children that are going to make dua for me? Have I worked hard for when I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yani, have I done what he told me to do? Have I stayed from what he told me to stay away from? Every single day. The angel of death is, you're, you're getting closer to that day. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, have I not given you the life for you to come to your senses? And the warner has come to you. That warner comes in many different shapes and forms. Sometimes the warner can be a white beard. One of your hairs become white, that's a sign. You're a loved one, a close family relative, someone you love passes away. In this world that you live today, this dunya that you live in today, Wallahi, I say this to you. You have no one who's going to help you when you meet Allah Yawm al -Qiyam. No, you're alone. The day you pass out, pass away, you die, and you leave this dunya, you even lose your name. One of the people who passed away that I saw recently, when they were washing his body, I remember they would take his, they would take him from one place to another, and they would kept saying, I was just watching him. They would say, can you move the body from here? They won't refer to him by his name. He's lost everything, even his name. Can you take the body from here? Can you put the body over there? Can you do this with the body? He's now called the body. There's no name attached to him. That's it. Khalas. A few months on the line, his wife is going to leave the idda. She's going to get married. Rightly so. The world carries on. We think we matter. We're the ones who assume that we matter. But we really don't matter. We're irrelevant. What matters is when we go to Allah, if we save our bones and our flesh from the hellfire. So brothers and sisters, this is a reminder to myself and it's a reminder to each and every one of you. Work towards pleasing your Lord. Work towards يعني, coming with righteous deeds. And leave behind something that when you die, it's going to carry on for you. It's a sadaqa jariya. A lot of us are investing money and we're thinking about passive income, which is fine, which is a good thing. But what about when it comes to akhirah? Why are we not thinking about when I die, this inshallah ta'ala is the one thing, I want to die and I want it to carry on. It can be a well, it can be orphans that you take care of. It could, it could, it could, it could be. Ask yourself a question. If you died today, are you ready for that day? If your answer is no, then you have an opportunity now to change yourself. And I saw a picture today, this morning, from a brother who was, when he was healthy and when he died, before, just days before he died. SubhanAllah, The human has been created very weak. Wallahi, we're very weak. And we have the audacity to think, me. How dare that person talk to me like that? Uh, I'm not going to talk to this person. You would wish that, that that day you didn't do that. When you meet Allah Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you would say, I wish I took the, the good Islamic path that I should have taken. Al-Amal Al-Salih. Al-Amal Salih, righteous actions, righteous actions, brothers. I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, Allah forgives us. Oh Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings. Oh Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings. Oh Allah, have mercy upon us. 
اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم اغفر لنا هزلنا وجدنا وخطأنا وعمدنا وكل ذلك عندنا يا رب العالمين اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا اللهم لا, اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يرحمنا رب آت نفوسنا تقواها رب آت نفوسنا تقواها رب آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا الله استغفرك واتوب